hello there. Don't worry, I'm not dead. Yet. But today, I'm making a video about a very interesting problem in my country. You see, I live in the wonderful land known as Kiwiland. One of the world's paradises. But there is a glaring problem with my people. We are absolute rigid about pretty much everything. A very good example of this would be our position on the environment. We are actually quite strict on not only preserving the environment, but also taking care of it. Like all other countries, electric vehicles will most likely become mainstream within my nation. However, this poses the problem as our grid is not relatively prepared enough to deal with that much more demand. There are just a couple of problems with this. One prominent one being is that the demand is in the north and the supply is in the south. There is a cable running between the two islands. However, the energy lost within the transfer is astronomical. In other words, it pretty much does nothing. So through some academic research and also using the internet for not just pirating anime, I have come up with some solutions to increase the supply of energy to help in the coming age of electric transportation. My first solution is to start selling EVs with solar panels installed on them. Though it has already been slated that the Tesla Cybertruck will have solar panels installed onto it, there are a number of other EVs that already have solar panels installed to it that could actually help to solve my problem. One of which is a Dutch prototype slated for release in 2021, the Lightyear One. This EV holds within it a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now, by the sounds of this, it means that it kind of already seems fairly average. But this futuristic Cadillac has a very unique design to it. The solar panels are mounted on both the bonnet, the roof, and the boot of the car, giving it an extra boost of energy. From the graph provided, the company states that the Lightyear 1 has a top range of 725 kilometers. Now, this is obviously on a constant stream of solar energy, but this still makes it one of the longest ranged EVs in the world. Now a car like this sounds too good to be cheap. And unfortunately you'd be right. From the company's website you are able to pre-order this car for 150,000 euros. Or in my country's currency, 260,000 dollars. Not to mention that it can only be driven in the Netherlands. Another EV that I started looking into was a German made Scion, constructed by Sono Motors. This EV is fairly similar to the Lightyear 1, but it does contain two major differences in its design. Firstly, it has solar panels plastered pretty much everywhere on the body, and it's much more suited to intercity travel. Using this graph again, it's easy to see that the Scion has a 255km range using a 35kWh liquid-cooled battery pack. But that's not all this Toyota Voxy lookalike has in store. Another attribute that this car has is it's heavily DIY implemented, meaning that many of the parts that come stock with the car can be replaced. The company would even go as far as to provide a manual for replacing all the electrical equipment. Along with that, they are also partnered up with local electrical businesses that will help to replace the solar panels once they've come up to their expiration date. So how much exactly will this cost you? Well, surprisingly, not a lot. This car will cost you 25,000 and a half euros. For a comparison here, that's like buying a second-hand Ford Ranger XLT straight from the dealer. Now, how exactly would little old me know that? Because my dad bought one. It was a terrible decision. So, problem solved, right? Well, not exactly. Kiwiland is known as a place where you can experience all four seasons within a single day. Going off of that, and my own personal experience here, you'll be most precedented to find that a lot of cloud will start appearing from around the months of early March to as far as late December. Not to mention that both of these cars are still EVs. Therefore, they still require to be charged at your own home. So though it may not be a solution to my problem, it is still a step in the right direction with its innovation and technology. 
Which brings me up to my next point. My second solution is to invest into some new innovative ways to produce energy. So what energy source is there left to exploit? Well, there is really only one left that we can do at the current moment. Tidal energy. Three companies so far have already attempted to consent to the government to install turbines, the most ambitious being Crest Energy's 200 turbine array in the Kaipara Harbour. However, as of 2013, all proposed projects were denied due to concerns about the surrounding marine environment that the turbines will be placed near. But these companies aren't giving in. They're here to play the long game, like wind and solar energy before them. Speaking of which, solar and wind farms are a terrible idea. Though admittedly, some places have benefited from these forms of power generation, such as Tokelau, which just so happens to be a dependent territory state of New Zealand, and is completely solar-powered. Though there is a significant difference between the nation of Tokelau and New Zealand. From the little table that I have made, it is clear to see that there is a significant difference between the two countries. And though Tokelau does have high-speed internet, the demand between the two nations would be considerably different since New Zealand has the higher population between the two. But my primary concern, specifically with wind turbines, is what damage they could do to the local bird population here in New Zealand. Kiwiland is a well-known place known for its wide diversity of bird species. But these wind turbines could pose a threat to these species in the long run. I bring this up because it turns out that wind turbines are a very well known killer to native bird species that are able to fly. Which isn't really something that, say, a country where most of the native species in it are birds. They also tend to be an eyesore to look at, especially in places that are magnificent which is basically more than 50% of the entire land mass of this nation. So if we can't use renewables, then what other form of power generation could we use to power our transport if we can't use electricity on its own? Fortunately, one branch of the government has been looking into new types of fuel for our transport to use, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. These guys are attempting to bring hydrogen fuel cell cars into New Zealand while simultaneously trying to make them popular for the common people. So hypothetically speaking, what would happen if we instead adopted fuel cells over pure electric vehicles? Well, it would most likely be similar to how we have fuel and diesel here. The majority of the hydrogen would be imported into the country via old fuel tanker ships and then taken to the fuel stations via tankers as well. But the advantage that hydrogen holds over petrol and diesel is that the size of the hydrogen extractors would be relatively small compared to a full-on oil refinery. Their size can be anywhere from the very limitations of a 20-foot container to barely half that of a 40-foot container, which relatively means that we can plop a lot more of them around the nation. Unfortunately, with this, a new problem has arisen. We don't exactly have the best infrastructure of the West. Not to mention that there isn't a lot of competition within the hydrogen fuel car market. So far, only companies like Toyota, Hyundai, and Honda have actually come to make said hydrogen cars. But in doing so, they have built them in lower quantities for a higher price. And, as of recording this video, I have recently discovered that hydrogen fuel cell cars have a lower efficiency compared to that of a electric vehicle using a battery. In essence, they're basically the middle ground between petrol cars and EVs. Not to mention that the fuel prices of hydrogen are significantly higher due to the difficulty in producing said hydrogen. But, like the tidal turbines before them, these hydrogen cars will likely follow the same suit as EVs. It'll just take them a little bit longer to get into the public eye. But now comes the most baffling part of this entire predicament. You see, I forgot to mention one last thing about my nation. Not only are we strict about 
taking care of the environment, but we're also trying to become a world leader in renewable technology. I mean, when it comes to it, we're already in amongst the ranks of both Norway and Holland and superiorly far more advanced than that of Germany. But this is where I get the most trouble in trying to understand what exactly is going on with the government. For context, the graph that I'm showing right now is the overall ratio of power generation throughout my nation as of February 27th, 2020. The provider of said graph is TransPower, the national company for constructing power lines within the nation. Now, as you saw, the South Island already has an abundance of hydro power. The problem is, is that not a lot of people tend to use it because the vast majority of that power goes to other outside companies. Not to mention that only a quarter of the entire population of the country lives down there. Which means that the amount of electricity that they have is pretty much all they need. Even the largest hydroelectric power station in the country, Manapuri Power Station, wasn't built specifically to power New Zealand homes. In fact, it was originally designed to power an aluminium smeltery further south in Bluff. Whilst the residual power that this power station generated would go towards New Zealand homes. So what does this have to do with any of what I'm trying to say? Well, it's because of this. The government, for a long time now, has been attempting to get all power generation within my country to 90% renewable generation. And I will admit, it's a noble cause, but it sort of breaks down when you consent for something like this. Though this was pulled from Wikipedia, I did take a look at the document and all of these power stations were consented by the government. Note that they all have something to do with either natural gas or diesel. Now there are two reasons why I'm pissed about this. One, the diesel generators are being put into suburbs that are within the South Island, which has an abundance of energy as it already is. And second, it has been reported that our natural gas reserves are so low that we may not even have enough natural gas to get us to the next decade. And from a snapshot of 2017, it turns out that we were only able to generate 82% renewable. So, how could this be? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's because of the fact that we still have one of the largest coal-fired power stations in the country still active, the Hunley Power Plant, powering all of Auckland because of the fallouts that renewable energy has had in the north. In which case, it is completely impossible to have wind turbines or hydroelectric power stations up in the north to generate the same amount of capacity as in the South Island. Which is just... It just makes me so ticked off! <sighs> Look, the only way that my country would ever be able to reach that golden 90% renewable generation, we would have to decommission the Huntley power station. But that's not going to happen because of how unreliable renewables are on a macro scale. I mean, people in Germany now have to choose between either buying heating for their home or getting groceries. The power prices have exceeded so much because of the amount of wind turbines that they're putting up and how unreliable they are. So much so that they have to reinstate old coal-fired power plants to help make up for their fallacies, which has driven up the price astronomically. After considering it, I believe that maybe hydrogen fuel cell cars may be our only option as opposed to electric vehicles. But if this doesn't happen, then what? This brings me to my last point, and this is the most unpopular opinion within my country. So, it may not happen, but it is still likely capable of becoming a reality, and a need that we just cannot avoid any longer.
Yep, I am saying that we really need to go there. I do believe that nuclear power may be our only solution if we are going to transition into a world of electric vehicles. But for those of you who live outside of Kiwiland, you may not understand how unpopular this opinion is. Because it is extremely unpopular. So much so that the government doesn't really want to use it. So in order for you guys to understand, it's time for a little bit of a history lesson. So now we must go back to a time when New Zealand was just young and the population was only just booming. In short, the mid-60s to early 70s was what I was referencing. The reason that I bring this up is because this was the time when the government was actually thinking about installing four 250 megawatt reactors at Oyster Point Kaipara, and they were actually on the verge of nearly constructing this. However, in 1973, close to the site of where these reactors were going to be constructed, they discovered the Maui gas fields. And yes, these are the same gas fields that I referenced that were basically not going to last us until 2030. Because of this, and the discovery of an extremely large coal vein next to the site, the whole project was essentially forgotten about and left in the archives. However, the Royal Commission at the time recommended that it wouldn't be needed during the 60s and 70s, however, it would become financially viable in the early 21st century. But this would become virtually impossible thanks to what I like to call the Dark Ages of New Zealand history. The dreaded 1980s. For the stereotype, the 1980s was a, a happy time where everyone was basically just living their lives, doing their own thing. Not for us, unfortunately! For us, this was basically financial purgatory. None of us were able to get jobs, and the government basically controlled the entire market system. I mean, they were operating hotels, airports, television, everything you could think of. And a lot of free market standing businesses were actually taxed out of their own goods that they produced here. This led to the formation of many of the gangs that we have today and a lot of people going homeless and just starting riots because of the fact that the government screwed them over. However, this wasn't actually a major contribution to why we despise nuclear. That blame would fall upon the amount of nuclear armed and propelled ships that the Americans were bringing over to our ports. Along with the nuclear bombing tests that the French have been doing up north in the Pacific. Because of this, many of the people in the country started to protest these nuclear ships from coming in, and the Navy would actually send out ships such as HMZS Taranaki to essentially do a silent protest of the nuclear tests that the French were doing. This, along with a change in government, would bring about the most well-known piece of political and documented law in New Zealand. The New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone Disarmament and Arms Control Act of 1987. To put this in a nutshell, it basically means that no nuclear armed or propelled ships or any ships carrying radioactive waste can enter within our exclusive economic zone. Of which, our exclusive economic zone extends as far north as Tokelau, to as far south as the Ross Dependency in Antarctica. But this means that, legally speaking, it is still viable to construct, say, a nuclear reactor on our soil, and you will not be completely arrested for it. Instead, you would be likely met with protesters, the Māori King movement, your face will be plastered all over the government, and you'd be completely demonized. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who do tend to protest this stuff tend to be a bit... Um, it's hard to say, but it, they're more or less like the PC movement in America. They are not exactly well educated in the benefits that nuclear can provide to our country. 
The only thing that these protesters tend to do is cite the negatives that nuclear power provides, specifically to do with reactor meltdowns such as Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi. By doing this, they essentially try to put themselves on the moral high ground and try to say that anyone who basically thinks that we should have nuclear power basically demonize them into next Tuesday. In other words, it's actually quite sad when you think about it. Dog eat dog world, I guess. However, some of their concerns are definitely warranted in our case, since not only do we not have the right facilities, but also our geography is not really the best. For example, one concern that they have is that we live literally on the fault line between the Australian plate and the Pacific plate, inside the Ring of Fire. Not to mention that we also have a plethora of dormant and active volcanoes just waiting to blow up. But this can be simply overlooked, as it's more of a placement problem. As such, you can probably just put the power station right next to where it was originally going to be at Oyster Point. Essentially, keeping it as far away from the fault lines as they possibly could. As for the volcanoes, it's actually quite simple. You build it further north in Northland. Because of this, there's not necessarily as many volcanoes up there as there is in the central North Island and further in the South Island. But even if you don't put all of these factors into account, there is still one country out there that still basically does all of this and still sits ne right next to this same fault line. Good old Nippon Japan. I mean, even after what happened with Fukushima Daiichi, they are still operating a plethora of nuclear reactors as they understand that, well, demand surpasses protest. But just backtracking a bit, I did mention before of a movement known as the Maori King movement. What they essentially are in a nutshell is basically a protesting movement that essentially protests Maori land rights. But historically, they were basically just an anti-monarchy, anti-United Kingdom movement that surfaced in the late 19th century. These guys would be the most likely to protest among the socialists and communists of New Zealand that, for some reason, still exist. But essentially, they don't necessarily have any sort of government power to basically back them up on some of their claims. They're just their own sort of movements. These guys will again use examples of negatives such as Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi, and they actually fear that a reactor meltdown will be imminent if we do construct a nuclear reactor here in New Zealand. But these claims can be dispelled fairly easily. Firstly, the Chernobyl power plant was Russian, and anything made in Russia is not of a good quality. It's easily repairable, but it isn't good. Along with the fact that whilst they were testing the reactor, the engineers of the plant actually shut down the safety procedures just to make sure that the plant was working well. And that's when it went into a critical state. Technology has come a long way, and with newer ways of integrating safety protocols to these reactors, They've essentially become the safest form of energy in the world, even beating the likes of solar and wind turbines. Which is actually something quite impressive to say the least, for something that's been demonized to all hell. With Fukushima on the other hand, it's a little bit different. Firstly, the reactor itself was hit with a natural disaster, a tsunami, so it was something that was outside of their control. Secondly, the vast majority of the deaths that were reported from the reactor accident didn't actually die from any sort of radiation leakage. In fact, the vast majority of deaths actually came from the fear of, well, the reactor actually leaking radiation. So with all of that off my chest, how exactly would New Zealand integrate a nuclear reactor into the power grid? Well, now comes the interesting part. An article made by the World Nuclear Association suggests that we integrate either a 250 to 300 megawatt reactor 
or utilize either a 1000 or 1800 megawatt reactor within our power grid. And by megawatts, that's the amount of power that each reactor can generate per second. They even suggest that we mine isotopes off the Chatham Rise and utilize them to make our own reactor-ready uranium. From what they stated, if we could dredge about 1.5 million metric tons of these isotopes, we could essentially have about 300 metric tons of reactor-ready uranium every year. Land wouldn't be a problem as well. After doing my own personal calculations of an average 1000 megawatt reactor in America, I came to the conclusion that a single reactor requires about 1 hectare of land to produce 3.6 megawatts of electricity. With this, a 250 megawatt reactor, which is considered the smallest reactor in the world, would only require 65 hectares of land to be constructed on. Well, give or take a few hectares. But there may be something even better. I read on an article once that it may be possible to convert the Huntley coal power plant into a nuclear power plant. Since both power plants essentially use the same method of energy generation, specifically making steam to spin a turbine to generate the power, it'd basically be the same. Not to mention that the main power plant has about four burning power stations that essentially generate 250 megawatts each, plus an additional two outside of it. So converting it into a nuclear reactor would make a lot of sense in that sort of perspective. But what I found interesting was that the reason the Royal Commission decided against installing a nuclear power plant in the first place was actually due to the recommendations of the New Zealand Ecological Society that was sent to them. And in fact, they were actually all for it. To quote an excerpt from their letter, We submit that New Zealand is rapidly approaching significant resource and environmental constraints with regard to energy supplies. Traditional sources of electricity and other energy forms will be quickly exhausted if high growth rates in demand are met. Nuclear power is an attempt to boost the local resource base by importing fuel in the form of uranium fuel rods. Well, it seems that these guys have predicted correctly that with the high growth rate, the resource demand has significantly strained itself in the local market. The funny thing is that these are the kind of people who actually wish to preserve the environment and have had gripes with all forms of energy production especially with renewable energy. And I do believe that we may not have to wait long, as new innovations within nuclear technology are now starting to come on the rise, with new companies opening up and submitting their own unique reactor designs that could not only be cost-effective to us, but could also help to produce much more energy just from lesser amounts of land. Even the richest man alive, Bill Gates himself, has started to invest into this whole new way of nuclear technological innovation, as he himself has recognized that nuclear will be the energy of the future. Well, at least he's doing something good with his money, instead of putting it towards people who are not really as competent as one might like. Though it may take us a fair amount of time to actually construct a simple reactor from nothing, considering that I stated before, our infrastructure is... it really isn't the best. It, it just honestly isn't. But I'd say that this would help out not only in our transport in all areas, but also in just common day-to-day -day life. Which is an added bonus, if I do say so myself. Now, I did write a script for this entire thing and saying a conclusion, stating that we would probably need to use nuclear reactors. But after having a bit of a think, I believe that we may not exactly be ready for any of these solutions at the moment. All of these solutions require 
a monotonous amount of time to not only sway the people, but to also sway the government and anyone else in the country just to make sure that everything runs smoothly. And with time comes new developments in technology. I'm going to be the first to say that I am completely not sure as to what may come in the future. But I honestly believe that all the solutions that I have presented have both their merits and their demerits. But all of them are still fairly useful if implemented correctly. So, in conclusion, I believe that the solution to my problem is the combination of all the solutions that I have discovered along with any new developments that will come our way in the future. But if I had to be completely honest, if there is one thing that I am certain of, it's this. Every petrol head in the world will become the greatest candidates for George Miller to use. Seriously, mate. Still waiting on that Fury Road sequel. Please, just make it. Thanks for watching this video. I know I haven't really uploaded in a while, but I've been dealing with two things. One, school, and two, I'm just lazy. But if you would like to see the notes that I have used in creating this video, I'll put a link to the document that I have in the description below. And if you have any ideas as to add to my video, hit me up in the comments down below. And thanks for watching. See you never. Bye.